welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit, exploring uh, pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. I'm Eva Schoenfeld, I'm here in Edinburgh, and today I'm speaking to Don, uh, Don Hall from Transition US, who's in Florida, on the other side of the world. Um, it's really lovely to have you, to have you here, um, Don, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I wondered if you could give us a little potted, a potted uh, version of, 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 of introduction to yourself. Yeah, cool. well, great to great to be here uh, in discussing the con the topic of conflict transformation. Um, I have been part of the international transition towns movement for about twelve years now. I uh, started with Transition Colorado, uh, which was the first official transition initiative here in North America. Uh, worked with them for about two years uh, as an education and outreach coordinator. Uh, and then moved uh, back to my hometown of Sarasota, Florida, where I am now, uh, to start Transition Sarasota. Uh, and did that for about six and a half years, uh, serving as its executive director. Um, mostly focused on local food systems, uh, growing our local food systems. And in 2017, I uh, came on board with Transition US. Uh, I currently serve as assistant director of Transition US. And a big through line uh, in all my work, even before I came across the, the transition movement, uh, has been leadership. Uh, I think that we don't lack any technology or information uh, to create a truly sustainable society and a more just society. Uh, but part of what we lack is leadership, the ability to uh, inspire and encourage people uh, to move in a better direction, uh, to get involved. And I think that's, you know, in transition, we are often very focused on changing systems, uh, changing our systems of food, energy, economy, healthcare, transportation, housing, et cetera. But we also recognize the importance of the inner transition and the importance of shifting culture uh, in small groups and in society as a whole. Um, and I think those are really important things to pay attention to. Um, I did a master's degree in environmental leadership at Naropa University uh, from 2007 to 2009. That's where I first came across uh, nonviolent communication, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and uh, a few years after that, in 2013, uh, took a course with a UK based transition trainer named Nick Osborne uh, that I think was called Effective Groups at the time, and have offered uh, a version of that training. Uh, as effective collaboration here in the U.S. Uh, multiple occasions since. Uh, so this is a, a topic that I'm you know, very passionate about in a professional context and also in a personal context. Uh, I've lived in two different intentional communities uh, over the last 10 years and uh, really see the value of uh, designing systems and processes and learning skills uh, for uh, interpersonal collaboration and see how much uh, of a difference that that makes. And also recognizing uh, that a lot of people don't get this kind of training. Um, we're not taught it by our parents, oftentimes, we're not taught it by our schools. We're not often not taught it in our workplaces. Um, and so I think it's a very uh, important topic for us to explore in transition because often the quality 
of our groups, uh, the quality of the relationships between people and how well we're able to work together really determines the quality of our external work, how effective we are uh, in addressing climate change uh, and economic instability. So um, very glad to be here with you. Um, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. So I guess the first thing that I wondered um, about uh, sort of asking you was, was more kind of like, so, that, so that's the kind of, you know the the professional um, framework for you know of the the various different things you've done, uh, but more about your kind of personal journey um, towards I guess like most of us kind of realizing that conflict was happening and problematic in one way or another. So how has it been for you your your journey with conflict um, and and sort of how how did that kind of first meeting with NVC impact? Um, yeah, why, why did it, why, you know, that, that kind of first meeting, what was that like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think I had heard about nonviolent communication, uh, but the first time I studied it when, was when I was going to graduate school uh, and read uh, Marshall Rosenberg's uh, classic book. Nonviolent communication, uh, and actually had the privilege to be able to participate in a three-day workshop uh, with Marshall, uh, who is unfortunately no longer with us. Although people all over the world are carrying on his legacy, uh, and I found it to be a useful tool at the time, and I think my level of esteem for nonviolent communication has only grown with time. Um, and there's, there are some issues with nonviolent communication, ways that it can be used improperly. Um, but we can talk a little bit about those later. I uh, really like your question about personal journey because, um, you know, we're all on that journey. And I think it's a, a lifelong journey of learning. Uh, you know, maybe we, we might think that we have uh, conflict handled, uh, that we know what to do. And then there's always situations that come up and surprise us. Uh, so there's always, always more to learn about uh, how to navigate and transform conflict. I think by nature, uh, I am a fairly conflict avoidant person. Um, I think that, uh, you know, my nature is to want to make people happy uh, and to keep the peace. And it's been a very interesting journey, uh, particularly, yeah, I would say, I would say my entire adult life, uh, which has been about the last 20 years, um, but particularly in my time with transition, um, you know, learning that we need to lean into conflict, um, that uh, conflict avoidance often means not doing away with the conflict, but uh, rather uh, suppressing the conflict uh, so that it, uh, you know, festers in our homes and in our workplaces uh, and creates problems over time. It creates uh, divisions between people uh, where we don't trust each other enough to uh, really speak our truth to each other and have faith that we can find our way through it together. Uh, and oftentimes when things are pushed down, they can uh, accumulate over time and bubble up and then some suddenly it all explodes um, and we we may find ourselves getting angry at something that seems completely trivial uh, and but that's because there's the whole iceberg uh, of uh, frustration and um, 
disappointment, anger, hurt underneath the surface. Um, so I think it, I've over time really recognized the value of leaning into conflicts and dealing with conflicts uh, before they uh, become large. You know, to bring things up as they arise, even if they seem like minor issues. You know, it could be one of my housemates at the intentional community here uh, leaving dirty dishes. You know, and I could let that go, but I realize that if I don't uh, address it immediately, it's going to turn into a bigger thing. Uh, it's going to be an ongoing problem. There's going to be resentment. Um, so I'm doing better at that. Uh, I wouldn't say that I perfected it uh, because we also have to know when to let go of things as well. We can't turn every little you know, annoyance, every little thing that rubs us the wrong way into a big conflict. Um, so finding that balance uh, is really key, and that's something that I'm still working with. Um, but I think over the years, I've learned more to, to lean into that conflict, uh, even if I don't want to, and to um, address it uh, so that it doesn't spiral out of control. Yeah, so it all sounds very familiar <laughs> to me too. Um, and I guess it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of people's tendency is that kind of like, just let it be. Um, but it, yes, it, it frequently backfires. But I wondered whether you could take us through the, the kind of nuts and bolts of NVC because there's four stages, are there? And they're, they're all kind of really important to get your head around. And, and I feel like, you know, this is the kind of thing we can take out of the box and really show to people. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there's a lot more to NBC than just the four stages, but I, I do think it's really at the heart of what NBC is. Uh, I do teach this as part of uh, effective collaboration training, and I find it to be very useful to talk about um, the underlying principles for each of the stages, mm. because you know we 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 might practice NVC in a very formulaic way uh, for us to get used to going through the stages, but ultimately we need to be uh, fluent in nonviolent communication. We need to be able to do nonviolent communication uh, without feeling like we have to cling to the formula so that we can actually relate to people that we're in conflict with uh, that don't know NVC uh, without kind of forcing them into our methodology, uh, which can put them at, at a disadvantage uh, in that situation. Uh, if they're forced to play by a rigid set of rules, that they're not familiar with. And I think that's one of the uh, biggest causes for the abuse of nonviolent communication uh, is when people force it on a situation with people who are uh, not previously familiar with it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the four stages uh, from that perspective of that these are really natural principles that we can weave into our communication uh, with others that they don't need to be applied in a kind of rigid, necessarily linear fashion. Um, and I think this is very much in the keeping with the teaching of Marshall Rosenberg. Uh, he had uh, some kind of funny ways of describing things um, sometimes almost childlike, even though uh, he's used he used nonviolent communication to defuse uh, tribal wars in Africa and to work with 
uh, egregious sex offenders in jail. Uh, I mean, he dealt with some very hardcore situations, but he also put things in a very gentle way. Uh, so he talked about, um, what was it? Formal giraffe. He calls uh, MVC giraffe language uh, because apparently giraffes have the biggest hearts uh, of any animal. And so he talked about formal giraffe, which is the kind of procedure for MVC, and then informal giraffe, which is what we use in the world. Uh, we could just say formal and informal MVC. <laughs> uh, so the four stages are um, observations feelings, needs, and requests. Uh, and I'll go through them one by one, but please feel free to uh, interrupt me uh, at any point to ask any kind of clarifying questions uh, or anything else uh, you think would be helpful for viewers. Um, so the first step is observation. Uh, and Observation is meant to be completely uh, separated from judgment. Uh, one of the big problems with how we typically and instinctively um, approach conflict is that oftentimes uh, we are feeling hurt and we want to uh, jump right into that. Uh, and we think that our interpretation of this situation, our assumptions about the situation, people's intentions, and even what actually happened in terms of the facts of the situation, uh, that we have the correct version and nobody else does. Uh, if they do, they're just wrong. But we know, we know from studies of, you know, eyewitness testimony in, in crime situations uh, that we are not always reliable witnesses, even to situations that we personally found ourselves in. Um, so we really need to check out at the beginning what happened. What happened and what happened from a very, uh, you know, very kind of clean and clear perspectives. So uh, we, we might start off by saying uh, something like, you know, I observed that uh, you left a bunch of your dirty dishes on the counter uh, for the last couple days. Um, and that's that's my observation. Uh, somebody else might say, well, it actually wasn't a couple days. Um, you know, I left them there from Wednesday night through, thir through Thursday afternoon. And so we're getting, we're getting clear about how we, how we each saw the situation that precipitated this conflict um, and making sure that we're seeing all angles of it. So in putting forth our observations, we are not attacking, we are not judging, we are not making any assumptions, and we're offering uh, others the ability to do the same and to check uh, our perception of the situation. Uh, so that's the first stage of observation, and that uh, lays the groundwork for a then deeper conversation about how the situation impacted us. Uh, so at every, every point in this process, I think it's important to recognize that there's, there's an aspect of self-reflection, uh, that it requires us to be self-aware uh, of you know, what were our perceptions, what our judgments, 
be able to see clearly the difference between our assumptions and our perceptions and to realize that there can be multiple perspectives on the same situation that are not always mutually exclusive. Uh, sometimes, you know, there are undeniable facts, even in the you know, supposedly post-fact world that we live in. Um, but the way that we perceive situations is different, and that provides us with important information. Uh, and can start to kind of draw people out and create a safe space uh, in which this kind of conversation can happen, that we're not just jumping on people immediately, uh, that we're not attacking, that we're really trying to get the heart of what actually happened, why did it happen, and what can we do to move forward. So that's the first stage of observation. The second stage uh, is feelings. And this may not seem entirely intuitive at first, but I think there's a very deep logic uh, to how MVC has been um, created and uh, described. So feelings are our own feelings. It's uh, a feeling is not, I feel that you're kind of a jerk. <laughs> That's not a feeling. Uh, our, our feeling in that sense might be frustration. It might be anger. Uh, it might be resentment. Uh, it might be disappointment. Um, but it's not, I feel that you're a jerk. That's, that is projection, uh, and we're really working on uh, not projecting in this situation, trying to see the real truth of what's going on inside ourselves, inside others. Uh, so we're introspecting, what was the actual feeling that I felt as a result of this? How did this, how did this conflict impact me uh, on, on the feeling level? And again, providing the opportunity for others to express what their feelings are. Um, and if somebody is not familiar with NBC, which is uh, usually the case, um, you know, they might say, I feel like you're a jerk. Um, and you can say, okay, I hear that. Uh, but like, how did this situation really impact you? What kind of, you know, what did you, what did you feel directly from this? And, and part of this is really understanding the impact that the conflict had on everybody participating. And usually everybody uh, in a conflict situation feels bad about it. It's very rare that, you know, somebody will say, well, my feeling was, uh, this is awesome. I was totally winning. Uh, I really enjoyed seeing you cry. Uh, you know, usually everybody feels bad. And I think that's a very important thing to recognize because that, that can kind of bond us in empathy. We all don't like this situation. None of us like this situation. We want to do better than this. We don't usually want to hurt other people. We usually don't want people to feel feelings of disappointment or frustration or anger. Um, so we start to empathize. Uh, we start to start to hear what the reality of the situation is for ourselves and others. Uh, and that enables us to continue to progress uh, through this process towards some kind of resolution, transformation. Um, so that's that's the feeling stage. And, uh, you know, this book really is a tremendous resource if anybody is learning nonviolent communication. It has lists of, you know, these are feeling words. These are not feeling words. 
Um, so you can really start to get a, uh, uh, gain an understanding of, um, you know, how we can uh, develop a vocabulary to describe our inner landscapes, uh, which is a key part of this. And it's something that we, again, are not trained to do. It was one of the things that was the most striking for me when I first uh, came across NDC was, you know, words like belittled, I feel belittled, or I feel dismissed, or um, mm -hmm. I feel blamed. Mm -hmm. You know, aren't feeling words. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, I still sometimes really struggle with finding, like, so what is the feeling? Uh, and I often find a really good question is, so when I feel belittled, what, what am I feeling? You know, what does is, what is feeling belittled feel like? Mm -hmm. um, because there are so many feelings under there, you know. I'm angry when I feel, when, you know, so it's like, it's like just knowing that, there's a, that that's fine, that's an interpretation, but there's, there's stuff underneath that that's where the real kind of juice is. Yeah, it's very much a kind of peeling of the onion. Um, you know, here in the book, it says, you know, words that are not feelings are things like, I feel abandoned. Uh, you know, and we've all had that feeling, you know, that's sometimes how it strikes us first, that we feel abandoned. But what's really going on beneath that feeling of abandonment? Uh, so that's part of the reason why I say this is really kind of a self-awareness practice in a lot of ways and almost verging on a spiritual practice um, of understanding ourselves. Uh, particularly, you know, these conflict situations are often the situations where we experience the most extreme emotions and the biggest psychological challenges. Um, so there is a potential to really learn a lot about ourselves as well as others, uh, through, uh, conflict. Yeah. But it's also, you know, it's at that moment, that particularly something like abandonment, um, it's, it's really vulnerable to acknowledge the feelings that are underneath that. So to say I feel abandoned, you can feel angry because you've abandoned me and that was a really horrible thing for you to do. Whereas if you dig under the, the, the abandonment mm -hmm. frame, it's, you know, I feel really sad or I feel lonely or I feel lost, which are much more, you know, they're, they're not angry things to share. They're, they're scared, sad, lonely things to share. Um, which which really changes the energy of the of the, the conflict and it and feels certainly to me feels way more vulnerable particularly if I'm also feeling angry because you know of this I didn't want to have to feel those feelings um, yeah it's it's it, again it's it's more of that kind of practice of of um, being willing to reveal those parts of yourself which feel much more. Um, uh, yeah, much less less strong and and uh, kind of active. Yeah, and just taking that example again of abandonment uh, versus anger or sadness, you know, abandonment sets up this oppositional thing. You know, I am the victim, you are the perpetrator, uh, and we are on opposite sides of this. And I feel justified because you have wronged me. If we can get down to the feeling level of things, then we can take more ownership. It still doesn't mean that this, this situation is my fault. Um, maybe there, you know, maybe the other person really did something that was uh, very hurtful. Um, but putting people on the defensive. Uh, does not help us get to where we want to go, which is some kind of re resolution, some kind of transformation, some kind of learning, some kind of 
better strategy going forward, it usually just causes people to entrench and defend themselves. Um, so we're not letting uh, bad behavior off the hook here. Um, but we are trying to con create the conditions uh, for change. And so that's, that's part of the, the feeling as well. Um, continuing on, uh, the third stage is needs. And needs, I think, is the trickiest stage for most people. Um, because, again, we have not been taught or trained to identify basic needs. Um, and again, um, nonviolent communication, uh, the book, and uh, resources like the, the international uh, website, uh, network of practitioners have a lot of resources for this. Um, you know, how to distinguish uh, a genuine need uh, from maybe a want. Uh, you know, I need you to stop being such a jerk. Um, okay, that, that's not what we're really talking about here in needs. Um, what we're talking about in needs is um, something very close to uh, use Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, very often because it's something that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and, you know, while it may not be, you know, perfect accounting of all the, all the needs that we may have, uh, it does help us begin to kind of think about what our needs uh, versus what are our not needs. Uh, in in terms of this nonviolent communication process, so you know, with the hierarchy of needs, we have things like physiological needs at the base, you know, food, water, warmth, shelter, rest, uh, things like that. So those are very real needs. Uh, everybody has them. Everybody can understand them. Everybody can respect them. Um, and so in ter if, by expressing things in terms of basic human needs, we continue to build empathy. Uh, that we, don't, we generally don't want people's needs to be violated. We don't want our own needs to be violated. And there's, there's a bond there. We, we're continuing to kind of build momentum towards resolution, towards an understanding that this conflict is hurting, it's negatively impacting everybody involved, and how can we find a better way? But it's not just physiological needs, obviously. Uh, we humans are not just uh, physical creatures. Um, we have safety needs. Uh, which I find are big one, and safety uh, can be, you know, physical safety, but it can also be emotional and psychological safety. Uh, and then we have belongingness uh, and love needs. Um, we have esteem needs, uh, feelings of, you know, uh, a need to feel respected, a need to feel connected with other people. These are real basic human needs. They, they are not less important uh, than you know, food and water and shelter. Uh, we all need these things to be healthy, productive, creative, uh, happy people. Um, so all things that need to, to be respected um, in our communities and through the process of conflict. Uh, and then at the top of Maslow's pyramid, we have self-actualization needs. Um, so 
realizing, being able to realize our full human potential or our potential as communities uh, is a very real need uh, that we all have. So, you know, thinking about those different levels of, of needs, uh, then we can begin to kind of express what needs were not met by the situation. You know, I have, I have a need to feel safe in my own home. I, and it's not, it's, I think, I'm not sure whether nonviolent communication, whether other practitioners would, if all NVC practitioners would agree with this, but uh, through my experience of using nonviolent communication, I do believe that it's valid to speak to needs that are connected to the groups that we're in as well. You know, I have a, a need for this for this group to work well together. I have a need to to feel like we can accomplish what we're setting out to accomplish. Um, that those those are valid needs, even if they're not I statements. Uh, that we are part of these communities, we are part of these collections. And we can speak on behalf of them, um, particularly yeah. when these conflicts come up in groups. Yeah. yeah so, so it's almost like an, uh, uh, an embodying a need of the group, embodying a need for for the group to to be coherent or, or achieve its purpose, or uh, you know, be a productive place to work in. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting way of doing it. Yeah, I think it's very valid. Um, and I see the, the need for that to come up. Because if somebody is taking too much time in a meeting and they're going off on all sorts of wild tangents uh, and they're causing disruption in the group, how how do I express that need? It's not just a personal preference. Um, it is my need. I need for this group's time to feel respected. Uh, but it is connected to to the larger group, and it does speak to uh, need of groups and communities. So I would be very interested. I haven't really seen um, much in from nonviolent communication. It, it's really uh, described as kind of one-to-one -one communication. But to to expand that outwards to to groups and communities, uh, how we resolve conflicts, I think is a fascinating subject um, to apply nonviolent communication to uh, as well. And presumably you've used it and, and found that it, it it does align and it and it kind of it helps groups uh, and people within them to move to a place of greater harmony. So so yeah. Absolutely. And I think you know when you're able to express that uh, to express needs in a group context, such as I need to feel like the group's time is respected, somebody can hear that a lot easier than saying, uh, you're a loud mouth, you're taking up too much space, um, you know, you're going off on all sorts of crazy tangents, you're causing division in the group. It's this is a need of the group that's not being met. And chances are the other person in the conflict will say upon reflection, uh, yeah, I want the group to, to feel like it's time is being respected. That was not my intention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by expressing it as a need instead of as a judgment or an attack, uh, 
uh, we open up the space for that kind of realization to happen. Oh, I see now how my behavior is impacting everyone else around me. And I didn't see that before, uh, which I think is, is often the case. I mean, it's very rare, at least in my experience in activist groups, that uh, people uh, um, you know, are, are participating in those groups in bad faith, mm-hmm. that, they, you know, that they actually have some kind of hidden agenda. Um, that they actually have some kind of um, ill will towards the group. Much more often, it's a result of people's needs, deep, deeper needs, not being met. Um, and, you know, that may go back, you know, a lifetime. Uh, but they are. And they may be acting out of a sense of those needs not being met, unconsciously not realizing how it's impacting others. Uh, and so to be able to express that as a need really cuts through uh, all of the uh, distrust, all of the kind of oppositional um, stances that we can take and says, you know, we can often recognize like, oh, I have that need too. We are all human. We are all part of groups and communities. And we want, the generally want the people around us uh, and the groups that we participate in to have their needs met and to be able to thrive. Yeah. I was, I was, you know, when you, when you would, were- talking about that, you know, people show up in groups with their whole history and their whole um, kind of, you know, the, the, the difficulties that we all bring along, along with us as, as you know, whole human beings in groups. Is that something that you would, um, you know, is there, is there a way of dealing with somebody's, you know, whatever whatever motivation it is that might make somebody take up a lot of space without having to uncover all of that kind of painful uh, history that they're bringing because people often don't want to show that in a group where they've, you know, they've turned up to make a community orchard. They, you know, they've not turned up for therapy. <laughs> and yet well, they also be proud. Yeah. I think it's an extremely important topic. Uh, it's one that, I've wrestled with for a long time. And I I do think that it's um, not necessarily appropriate uh, to do that kind of digging. I mean, we are not, we are not trained therapists, most of us. Um, And, you know, sometimes the, sometimes issues, uh, patterns uh, that come from very early on in life, um, can take decades to unpack. So the question of how do we do, how do we respond to that? Because these things do show up in our groups and we have to find a way to respond to it. I don't think taking the approach of, you know, we need to get down to the absolute root of this is very practical uh, for social change groups. Uh, even in an intentional community, uh, we recently had somebody um, who is a housemate uh, in my intentional, in the intentional community where I live here in Florida, uh, who we had to ask to leave. And we tried uh, on a number of occasions to work with her, um, but she was constantly creating conflicts and division. Uh, in the house. There was a lot of underlying uh, emotional and psychological uh, maybe trauma, um, but we could just say simply issues, uh, that it became eventually clear that uh, these were not going to resolve themselves. 
and we uh, tried to work with a process of resolution for her, but they kept coming up again and again. And and the last straw for us was her not being willing to address the conflicts and just saying, uh, you know, screw you. I am the way I am. I'm not going to change. Uh, I don't like you. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And we drew a line and said, that is not acceptable in the house. We can't live that way. We can't live with people hating each other on the, under the same roof and thinking that that's an okay situation that we can live with. Uh, so at that point, we asked her to leave. And I think that is, it, it's important, and maybe we can talk about this in a few minutes, uh, to have some kind of some kind of process uh, of resolution uh, put out there that people can use and take advantage of, and that people are held accountable to. So if they're not willing to go through the process of, re- of resolution, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to completely transform themselves, but it does mean that they have to be willing to hear what other people's feelings and needs are and to work on it, to try to provide some kind of remedy uh, to how their behavior is negatively impacting others. And eventually there needs to be some place where we can, we can take action and say enough is enough Um, rather than allowing people to, just ignore conflicts to let these problems fester and potentially destroy our communities. Yeah. And you were saying earlier when we were talking about that refusal to engage with the process is sometimes, you know, it's like the most difficult thing to deal with because you're only having one side of (laughs) only having one side of the conversation. Yeah. And I think that's that's particularly a difficult point for those of us who are social change activists, uh, that we really care about people. We don't want to give up on people. Um, we don't want to enforce hard lines or rules. Uh, but, yeah, it, eventually if there is a unwillingness to resolve conflicts and there's a pattern of continuing to perpetuate conflicts, we do have to draw those hard lines. Not that we're necessarily giving up on that person. Not that we're saying that that person is bad or irredeemable, but we do sometimes need to protect ourselves uh, from from the damage that's being caused. Uh, and we need to protect our groups and communities as well. So we can look at it from that, that perspective. Um, when I was living in a community house in Boulder, Colorado, uh, we also had to ask somebody to leave uh, under some very extreme circumstances. Uh, but we helped that person find another place. Uh, and we went and visited and talked with him and helped him through uh, his his crisis. Uh, but we just realized it wasn't fair to everybody in the house for him to be there, um, you know, causing turmoil every single day, that it was not no longer a good fit. So I think we can apply that to social change groups as well to say, you know, Maybe this person isn't fitting in this role, but maybe there's another role that they could play. Um, maybe there's something else that they can do to get to the place where then they can step back in. Um, but yeah, I think uh, yeah, sometimes sometimes we have to uh, take action uh, and not just sweep these things under the rug. Uh, because they can destroy uh, communities and they can destroy groups if left unchecked. 
we were on needs. <laughs> yeah, so we were on needs, and I think our, this um, this conversation has been a good segue to requests. So we've gone through the observations, we've gone through uh, sharing our feelings, sharing our needs. So now we have a pretty good sense of the landscape of the conflict, how it's impacted others, what needs were not met and need to be met in this situation. So we kind of are already moving towards resolution in terms of understanding what needs to change. Uh, so that will that guides us in the, the final stage of making requests. Um, and the way I teach it, uh, I bring in this concept of SMART goals uh, mm -hmm. to help people figure out what, what kinds of requests are helpful and what kinds of requests aren't. Um, so SMART is an acronym. Uh, it stand, sometimes stands for different things, uh, but the most uh, common is that uh, they need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. S M A R T. Um, and I think all of these aspects are helpful to discover. Uh, to consider uh, that we need to be specific. We can't say, uh, I want, my request is that uh, you completely change your personality and your lifestyle. Um, I, you know, I, I, my request is for you to be, be a decent person. It's like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, that's, that's not specific. It's not measurable. It's not necessarily achievable. Uh, and it's not timely in the sense that we could say, you know, can you do this within the next week? Can you do this within the next month? Uh, a much you know better request would be, you know, something like, you know, and I go back to the dishes thing because it's so relatable. Um, and, you know, if you can't, one of our house agreements that we have is, you know, we wash our dishes when we're done with them. If you can't do that because you have, you know, you got to run off to something or whatever, uh, you leave them in a neat stack and you leave at least one half of the sink open so people don't have to work around your dishes to wash their own. Uh, and you come back to them at the earliest. So that's a lot more specific than saying, uh, I would like you to stop being such a mess. Um, where we actually have a game plan here for how it's going to happen, what it's going to look like when it's done, um, that we can uh, confirm it, we can check back in at a certain point. Maybe we say, okay, we're going to try this for two weeks and then we're going to meet again uh, to see how we're doing with it. Um, so specific, measurable, achievable, relevant uh, to the situation um, because we don't, we don't want to, um, you know, drop the whole uh, kitchen sink on everybody uh, or, you know, the person that we're in conflict with. We're not bringing up uh, everything that they ever did wrong and asking them to be a perfect person from now on. We're, we're addressing a specific instance, which is another reason why it's important to address conflicts as they arise rather than allowing them to accumulate over time and then just dumping on a person uh, all their misdeeds um, that we address things one by one so that we can find uh, solutions that that really work that address that and that are achievable um, so we can make a request of others uh, 
they can also make requests of us uh, and should be encouraged to. Uh, and these are really requests, you know, an important thing to keep in mind is that these are, these are meant to be requests not only to meet our needs, where in nonviolent communication, we're not only asked to uh, make requests that meet our own needs uh, and address our own feelings, but that address the whole the situation as a whole. Uh, so we're taking into account others' needs and looking for solutions that can meet everybody's needs in the situation. That can, uh, and you know, if that's two people, what's going to improve our relationship here? Not how can I get what I want, and you know, good luck with you. Um, how can we, if it's in a group, how can we, you know, use this to better the group? Uh, and, you know, how can we, how can we draw learnings out of this? How can we create uh, new structures or processes that embed this knowledge uh, in our group or in our community so that we don't have to go through this again? Um, and how do we address the, the point of conflict or friction? Um, so being able to make those requests, uh, being able to say, I can meet the, that request, or I can't meet that request. Sometimes people may request things of us that we, we just are simply not able to give, uh, that we would be violating our own needs uh, if we agree to give those things. But if you say no to a reasonable request, you need to explain why not. And then that becomes more information to potentially revise that request and get to a point where like, yes, that is doable. Uh, yeah, it's quite a fine so, negotiation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and I guess you know it does it does assume that you know basic goodwill on both sides, um, and and like you said that also the the kind of formal and the informal giraffe because that's you know the yeah. process you described would be one where where both people were kind of basically getting the dance that you were doing the, the kind of NBC dance, um, yeah. It, it's uh, do you find that it's it's you know relatively easy to because you were talking I thought that was a really um, a really important point about you know kind of uh, you know the, the the potential for kind of a bit of a feeling of abuse if you're trying to push somebody into the NVC dance who has never heard of it doesn't know about it hasn't agreed to it. Um, so what do you do in that situation where one person is, is like really well versed uh, and the other person you know, has never heard of this? Yeah, so I mean if it's, a, if it's a conflict that spontaneously arises, you know, say we're out in the world and we get into something with somebody at the convenience store. Um, I think, you know, it's it's about us doing the work as nonviolent communication practitioners of uh, separating out our observations from our judgments, our feelings from our uh, assumptions or evaluations, uh, our needs from our wants, uh, and being able to express ourselves clearly and to give others opportunities to, like, you know, you don't have to say, okay, uh, you know, person in line at the convenience store who wasn't social distancing, I want to do a nonviolent communication pro process with you. I mean, they're going to look at you completely cross-eyed. Uh, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I feel like I'm being manipulated. Um, <laughs> instead, you say, oh, you know, it looks like you're, you know, s s not standing six feet away from me, and then give them some time to respond. 
or say, you know, how do you see this? Um, you know, what is the reason that you're not doing that? Or why you're not, you know, to basically be, be curious, be open, be uh, non-confrontational, don't make assumptions. You know, th these are the principles that underlie NVC. And if, you know, we're doing the work uh, of studying and practicing, these things become, start to become second nature. It takes, takes time. Um, but the, you know, it, it completely changes our orientation to conflict from seeing it, uh, as a problem, as a zero sum game, as, you know, uh, kill or be killed, um, to, oh, okay. There's some kind of misunderstanding going on here. There's some there's something that we could work out that we could learn and grow from and uh, actually uh, come through stronger. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, uh, you know, it can be very, very easily done in a way where people don't ever even know you're using nonviolent communication. You're not using words like observations and feelings and needs and requests. You are just, having a conversation where you are drawing from the principles of NVC. That said, in a group or a community, it can be very helpful to name NVC, that we want to do NVC, uh, we are going to study this a little bit together, maybe we even practice it a little bit together, um, and that it can be a touchstone. And it can be a very easy thing if there's a group that's uh, all on board with practicing MVC to say, okay, this came up, let's go through the process. And everybody knows that it's coming. Um, but, you know, I think you can uh, definitely use it outside of those kind of controlled situations. Uh, I think we find more of those situations uh, than the others. So we are probably coming towards the end of our conversation, but I know that you really wanted to bring in that that kind of structure that you felt was really supportive and kind of really really um, created a really healthy and helpful context for doing NBC inside us. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I think that. Um NVC doesn't stand on its own. Um, it, it, it's a very powerful tool that we can use. But if we don't have good structures, processes, agreements, so forth, in our groups, we are just going to continue to churn up conflict all the time. Uh, there's going to be a lack of clarity around expectations. We're you know, not going to have decision-making framework. So I talk about our effective collaboration training in that way, that all this stuff needs to kind of sync together, uh, that just using MVC by itself, um, well, it may be helpful. It's not a panacea. Um, but I think one piece that is particularly relevant to this conversation is having a conflict resolution policy, having some kind of process that we can uh, go through step by step if a conflict arises, uh, and we can use NBC as part of that. So a sample conflict resolution policy would be, you know, if a conflict arises, any party uh, is entitled to take a uh, time out to cool down. Uh, that, you know, usually it doesn't help to have emotions running high. Sometimes our emotions can kind of uh, override our capacity for self reflection um, and empathy. So, allowing that kind of cool down period, but also not extending that out indefinitely. So, here at the intentional community where I live saying uh, a maximum of two days 
before you revisit it. But everybody's entitled to that cool down period and a period of self-reflection before coming back together. Sometimes it's not needed, but it's there. Then we encourage members to work things out among themselves. If two people have a conflict among themselves, uh, they should first try to resolve it with each other. Um, and not, you know, they don't need to call a big meeting. They, you know, this doesn't have to be huge blow-ups either. Uh, it could just be some kind of proactive maintenance. Um, we could think of it like uh, brushing our teeth <laughs> or taking a shower. Um, so they try to work it out among themselves. Sometimes trust has broken down to such a degree and communication has broken down to such a degree that that kind of one-on-one -on -one resolution is not possible. Um, people can use nonviolent communication one-on-one, -on -one, obviously, uh, to resolve that conflict. But if they, if they can't do that with each other, they can go to another member of the group uh, and ask them to serve as a facilitator or mediator of the process. Uh, but all parties need to agree that that person is a neutral or a good faith facilitator mediator. If, uh, you know, one party thinks that that, per that person uh, is likely to agree with them or be on their side and the other person feels like that person is against them from the outset, that's also not going to work. Um, so oftentimes we can pull, especially as we practice this more and learn more about it, we can pull from the expertise from our group to help facilitate and mediate. But in certain circumstances, that is important to work um, because no neutral facilitator can be found within the group. Uh, at that point, it can be helpful to bring in an outside mediator, somebody who's professionally trained in this. This is something we did. Uh, at the housing cooperative where I lived in Boulder. Um, you can find mediators uh, in your area through a simple Google search. Uh, there often are trained mediators everywhere. They may not use nonviolent communication uh, as a specific tool, um, but a lot of mediation is based on the very same principles of nonviolent communication. So I think it would be very in line uh, with that process. And in that case, you know, they don't know any of the, they may not know any of the parties, they may be more neutral. Um, if that can't be done, if we've gone through all of that, there's no way to resolve it individually uh, or directly, there's no way to resolve it with in the group, there's no way to resolve it with uh, outside help, uh, then our next step in the process is that the individuals that are not involved in the conflict then get to make a decision uh, about what needs to be done. Um, and sometimes that may involve asking somebody to leave. Um, but you know, we, we try to provide as many chances because ultimately if we are willing to lean into conflict, we are willing to learn from our mistakes, we are willing to be vulnerable, uh, that's the most important thing because uh -huh. uh, we, we can get there. But if there's no willingness to resolve a conflict uh, and there's no hope of future resolution, that can be very damaging. It could be like a cancer that grows within the group or the community or the relationship. Um, and at that point, we have to be able to, to do something about it. Um, so at that point, it goes back to, to the group. And the, the most important thing about all of this is that this kind of a plan or policy is put in place before conflict erupts. Um, because when you're in the middle of a conflict and you don't have any kind of uh, process to, to steer by, that can be another layer of conflict on top of the conflict you're already dealing with is 
how do we resolve this conflict? What are the rules that we're playing by? Uh, so to have everybody, you know, new housemates moving into an intentional community or uh, new leaders joining a core group of a transition initiative to sign on to a conflict resolution policy doesn't mean we're not all good people uh, that, you know, that we are necessarily going to have terrible conflicts with each other. But we say we're doing this in case we need it. We're doing this uh, in a proactive way uh, in case we need it. And, you know, storming conflict is viewed as a, a pretty inevitable and healthy part of group development. We use the stages of group development as the main framework uh, for the effective collaboration training, forming, storming, norming, performing. Well, we come together in the beginning. There's a honeymoon period where everybody wants to be nice to each other, uh, oftentimes glossing over differences. And if we can feel safe enough in the forming stage, that often allows people to then express their differences in storming. So that's a healthy part. But how do we steer ourselves through that so we're not having to make up the rules in the middle of the game? really essential a, a lot of the people who I've um, spoken to so far have, have said very similar things in terms of kind of the, the need for these sort of structures and supports um, not that not because they will stop us from having conflict but that they will create safe containers for us to have our inevitable conflicts in um, and and you know also the kind of optimistic note that if if we have created safe, uh, safe containers and we use processes for uh, sort of being with the conflict um, that, that are kind of supportive to people and don't send them sort of further into their trauma, that actually, you know, that, that can be transformative. It can be, you know, the, the, the dishes is a very mundane um, kind of example, but, you know, in, in more complex Conflicts when when there's less clearly someone who has, um, you know, transgressed and someone who's been wrong. That that there is a yeah, there's a real kind of fresh understanding of somebody else's perspective um, and mm -hmm. some learning and some growth on both sides. That that you know that 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 kind of. Uh, a part of the gift of being willing to go through the discomfort of of being in conflict. Yeah. yeah. I guess just uh, last couple things fairly quickly. Um, so you, you had brought up the point about it takes people of good faith uh, on all sides to use nonviolent communication. And I think, you know, in my experience, most people are people of good faith, but sometimes there are, there are bad actors for whatever reason, and that's what the conflict resolution policy is for, is if the nonviolent communication process fails, um, if somebody is just not willing to respect the needs of other people in the community. Um, we do have you know, the conflict resolution policy provides some sort of an answer for that. And I guess uh, the last thing I really wanted to say was about the the concept of, uh, of leaning into conflict, uh, maybe to bring it a little full circle. Uh, I used to lead uh, 20 to 30 day flat water canoeing trips for at risk and adjudicated youth. Uh, here in the southeastern United States through uh, a group called Outward Bound uh, that I believe actually started in England. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did it. And, you know, a lot of these kids were kids from the city who had never been in the wilderness before. And we would be, you know, teaching them how to canoe on windy rivers. And uh, the... You know, the banks would have down trees and there would be spider webs and spiders in the trees. And, um, 
you know, the, the thing that we had to say to them over and over again was you have to lean in. Even, even, you know, if you're headed for that, you know, spider web and that down tree and uh, you're, you're pretty scared, uh, you got to lean in because if you don't, you're going to lean back. You're going to flip the boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think that that leaning in is a big part of how we, and I think I talked about this in our first discussion, was how we uh, uh, cultivate the collective genius. Um, is that, you know, by going through conflict with people, uh, finding that we can relate to each other in a respectful uh, and compassionate way through the worst of times, uh, we grow stronger, we grow more confident, we understand each other better, um, we begin to develop uh, institutional systems, like in the norming stage of group development, that benefit the the, the organization, the cause, the movement going forward, and uh, that really that that experience of being able to speak our full truths to each other, and to know that it will will be received and heard and respected and taken seriously. That's how we get to true collaboration, and that's how we get to collective genius. If we're always just kind of hiding ourselves and not rocking the boat, and we're missing out on a lot of wisdom. We're uh, missing out on a lot of uh, important, diverse perspectives and information. And uh, so by going through these conflicts, we're all, we're all stronger for it. An excellent point to end on. Um, thank you so much, Don. It's been really, really a pleasure and incredibly interesting. And, and, uh, very good for joining. Bye.